homes will do its job. Right. Not, not the way it worked out. I just want to say something about the reserves, right? This is the reserves, right. state bank, uh, you had a choice, right? Um, and that was one of the issues very early on, is a lot of the state banks didn't want to go in, and you know, since they were, they, they, they were containing the government reserves, right? Two, there was the government money, uh, somehow the, uh, the Fed bank, bankers wanted to figure out how, well, how to get those state banks in, and uh, there's a, a, a letter from Walberg in his archives where he's basically uh, saying to another banker, well, uh, if they don't go in, they're not going to get our protection. You know, it's sort of a threat. You know, if, if there's a bank panic, you can't come and get our uh, flexible currency. Um, so the in the act, the act mandated the, 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 the reserve requirement for member banks, okay? Which, now, at the beginning of the Fed, the, uh, a member bank had a certain percentage of the reserve that had to be deposited at their Fed bank. And then, there was another percentage that they could keep at, in their bank vault. And then they had, there's the remaining percentage of that reserve that the bank itself could decide, do I want to keep it in my Fed bank or do I want to keep it in my bank vault? So that was, the, that was where the reserves were at the beginning. Of course, the design of the system by you know, the, uh, the, the architect is how we want to get all the reserves in the Fed bank, right? We need the, that gold to issue our Fed notes. So the belief, more reserves in the Fed banks protected member banks. In other words, the Fed bank could issue more Fed notes since there was more gold backing if, if the, or more of the gold was in the Fed banks and uh, they'd be more protected, uh, so forth. Okay, so um, okay. now I want to get into uh, the war. So, keeping in mind about uh, the nature of the investment banks, the trusts, and everything. So this is the first part of Debt Drives War. 1914 to 1917, we went into war in April 1917. The US is neutral, supposedly, right? So, uh, August 1914, the war starts in Europe. On August 9th, which happens to be my birthday, <laughs> the firm of J.P. Morgan asked the U.S. Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, if the U.S. government would object to loans being made with the belligerent nations by the Morgan firm. Bryan advised President Wilson not to support this policy. Washington, August 10, my dear Mr. President, money is the worst of all contrabands because it commands everything else. I know of nothing that would do more to prevent war than an international agreement that neutral nations would not loan to belligerents. While such an agreement would be of great advantage, could we not, by our example, hasten the reaching of such an agreement? We are the one great nation which is not involved 
And our refusal to loan to any belligerent would naturally tend to hasten a conclusion of the war. Wilson, however, eventually decided to permit the loans. Okay. So that was uh, August of 1914 when the war started. January of 1915, the firm of J.P. Morgan and Company signed a commercial agency agreement, the formal contract, with the British government by which it entered into a wide range of purchasing and contracting arrangements with American firms on behalf of the United Kingdom. In May 1915, France made a similar agreement with J.P. Morgan. This is from uh, F. William Engdahl. He wrote a book about gods of money. Quote, Morgan served as intermediary for His Majesty's government in arranging purchases of munitions, arms, uniforms, chemicals, in short, all that would be needed to wage a modern war in 1914. As financial agent for the British government, J.P. Morgan and Company not only organized the financing of war purchases and decided which companies would be the suppliers, but it also set the prices at which the equipment would be supplied. Not surprisingly, corporations directly in the Morgan and Rockefeller groups of companies were the prime beneficiaries of Morgan's astute purchasing. And then here's another quote from Engdahl. In 1916 alone, American industry, despite the nation's official neutrality, exported a staggering $1.3 billion worth of war munitions to England and France. By the eve of America's entry into the war, J.P. Morgan and Company had organized the export of $5 billion worth of war material to the English and French and later Italian government, all bought on credit organized by J.P. Morgan and Company. It was, and this is from Engdahl, it was enough to cause a major banking crisis should the loans default. So here's um, from uh, Friedman and Schwartz, uh, they said about this period of neutrality. We have used statistical data for June 1914 as reflecting conditions at the outset of this period of neutrality. And for March 1917 at the end, over that interval of not quite three years, period of US neutrality, the stock of money rose by 46% and wholesale prices by 65%. In other words, we were building these weapons in this country and we were are prosperous doing it uh, and we were creating bank for that, all of that. Uh, as of December 30, one, 1914, the member bank reserve was at $1.5 billion. By March 5, 1917, the entrance of the U.S. into the war, the reserve stood at <coughs> $2.6 billion. So, huge expansion even before we entered the war based on this bank credit system. And, uh, okay, this is very interesting. Uh, December 4th, 1916, so uh, this is, uh, we've been uh, neutral now for two, 16, 15, two and a half years, right? The Honorable uh, William McAdoo, Secretary of the Treasury, reported to the nation 
that the U.S. stock of gold was the largest ever in our history, and indeed ever in the history of any nation. Uh, quote, this is uh, from the Secretary of the Treasury. During the past year, the prosperity which set in so strongly, he calls it prosperity, it's the creation of all these weapons uh, in the, all these industries in our country. The prosperity which set in so strongly during the fiscal year 1915 has grown in strength and volume and is now widely diffused throughout the United States. The financial strength of the United States, the greatest in our history, gives us a commanding position in world finance. We have been transformed from a debtor into a creditor nation. On November 1st, 1916, the stock of gold coin and bullion in this country was estimated at $2.7 billion, an increase of $714 million in the past 16 months. This is the largest stock of gold ever held in the United States or in any country of the world. And we're not even in the war yet. So, now we're, we're gonna enter the war, and now war is gonna drive debt. Oh, I wanna tell you, um, oh, I have to tell you. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, how do we get into a war? Uh, I think uh, President Wilson said we were there to we save democracy, right? That's why we went to war, right? So, um, the beginning of 1917, England and France were desperate. They had, uh, they had sort of run out of their credit with, with Morgan. It was uh, five billion, you know, and uh, they were desperate, and they were not only desperate because they didn't have any, they couldn't get any more credit, but things weren't great in the, in the Russian Empire. There were, uh, in February of 1917, riots broke out uh, in the major cities, and um, there were cries of uh, down with the emperor, down with the war. The Russian people were suffering, you know, terribly from the war. Um, not only the killing, but uh, not having basic things to live on. And um, England and France was really, really worried about what if the Russians dropped out of the war? Then the Eastern Front would be gone, and, and Germany would put all of their men on the Western Front against us. And, and we're, that's going to be the end of us. And actually, in uh, more, I think it was March 15th, uh, the Tsar actually was deposed. Okay. So, March 5th, 1917, in London is the, um, our ambassador, Walter H. Page. And he's been there for a while. I, uh, Wilson, you know, so, you know, picked him, and uh, and he loved the English. He was there. He wanted to support the English as much as he could. He was part of their, you know, their uh, their class. And he uh, he wrote this letter on March fifth, nineteen seventeen, to President Wilson. It's a long letter, and I'm going to read you part of it because it it really shows how debt drives the war. Quote, the inquiries which I have made here, this is the page talking, here in London, about financial conditions to disclose an international situation which is most alarming to the financial and industrial outlook of the United States. Our outlook. <laughs> Great Britain and France must have a credit in the United States which will be large enough to prevent the collapse of world trade and the whole financial structure of Europe. If the United States declare war against Germany, the greatest help we could give Great Britain and the Allies would be such a credit. A great advantage would be that all the money would be kept in the United States. We could keep on with our trade and increase it to the world. 
you know, we're making weapons, that's our trade, right? We should thus reap the heart of the profit of an uninterrupted and perhaps an enlarging trade over a number of years. Of course, we cannot extend such a credit unless we go to war with Germany. The pressure of this approaching crisis, I am certain, has gone beyond the ability of the Morgan Financial Agency for the British and French government. The financial necessities of the Allies are too great and urgent for any private agency to handle. There is now an uncertainty about our being drawn into the war. In the meantime, a collapse may come. And uh, that was March, March 5th. Uh, and I think it was April 2nd, uh, the next, next uh, three weeks later, Wilson walked over to Congress and asked them for a declaration of war to save democracy. That drives the war. Okay. Now, we're going to go into... So, for me to understand that a little bit <clears throat> more simply, debt drives war. So what's happening is France and England, and I think Germany was actually a part of that system too, but, but England and France are taking all of their gold reserves, sending them to the U.S., and, and, and buying ammunition, et cetera, with them. Is Morgan then extending credit to them, and that's the debt part of debt drives war, or, or how? I need to think of that. Both, that both were happening. And I'll, you bring it up, I wasn't going to go into it. This is getting late, but I'll just mention. Um, the three things. No, I just said it's at midnight. <laughs> no, we're not. I know. Like, oh. I know. Um, there's not much more of this war, but um, just what, it, what, what England and France did in this period of neutrality. They, they sent one billion of their gold, they shipped it over here to pay. For the weapons, that was part of it. That's why all the gold flooded into the, the banking system. Okay, so there's no debt associated with that. Did it go no. to wonder. Did J.P. Morgan or to the Federal Reserve banks, or was there a difference? Um, they probably gave it to Morgan. He was their agent. He was their agent. Uh, then they also, England, England and France, I, I don't know about France, but England definitely confiscated from their citizens American stocks and bonds that had been bought, you know, because our economy was growing and they could make profit. And they sent them over to Morgan and he sold them on the New York Stock Exchange to, to raise money, right? So that was another thing they did. And the third thing is, he, he floated loans. He sold stocks and bonds, foreign stocks and bonds on the U.S. Stock Exchange to raise money for them. Okay. And he was able to do that, you know, because he was prosperous. Okay. So the Allies, French and, uh, this is the conclusion, the Allies, French, French and English, raised a total of $5.3 billion with all those three mechanisms. And on top of that, he rolled up some of his credit. Oh, on top of On top of that, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those bonds. But he had, he had sort of it's been extended by the time, the beginning of 1917, which is why the ambassador said, you know, he's, it's not, it's not going to carry us through the war. We've got to do something else. And we can only do that if we go to war to give them the credit. I think what's happening in terms of, I think the Federal Reserve ends up with the gold because Morgan turns around and needs the dollars to pay for the, uh, the ammunitions and whatnot, and they're paying for those ammunitions, not in gold generally, but in, in, in dollars. In bankers. In bank, in, in bank credit. Yeah, uh, yeah, bank, reserve notes and bank credit. Yeah. So the gold actually then stays in the Federal Reserve system. 
So um, I don't have a slide for it, but uh, so we went to war, and we had to raise money. So the treasury had to sell treasury bonds, and there were five issues of them throughout the war, our war years, and the last one was after the war ended. They were called Liberty Bonds, and they, they, uh, there were five issues, and the total of all five issues that were allocated uh, was $21.5 billion. On top of, you remember, the five billion was more than a million. Um, and, and the Secretary of the Treasury, at the beginning, he was thinking, well, you know, I'll raise it from, from the public, from the savings. And, and so, you know, the money's just sitting there, we'll just use that. And then he got too scared because there's too much money that we needed. So, uh, here's a quote from one of the sources. In order to ensure the full sale of each bond issue, the Secretary's intention of carrying the campaign directly to the public was changed in practice to greater reliance on bank borrowing, credit creation, both direct and indirect, inadvertently causing an expansion of the money supply. Big expansion. Okay. Now, to do this, though, we had to tweak the Federal Reserve Law to make it possible for all of this bank credit to be created. And uh, so there were two amendments that I uh, tweaked it for this purpose. Okay. The first one, uh, this one is the amendment of September 7th, 1916. This is before we got in. Okay. And uh, the federal, the Fed banks were allowed to make direct loans for 15 days to their member banks. Direct loans collateralized by the Treasury debt. Right? Very, very helpful for waging the war. Um, and Friedman and Swartz said, once the United States entered the war, loans on government securities began to rival those commercial paper. That, uh, we thought the Fed was going to be used for the commercial transactions. Now it's used for the war transactions. And then there was another amendment after we got into the war. We got into the war in April 1917. So on June 21st, 1917, there uh, this amendment, and this was extremely important because it affected the reserves. And uh, the first thing that happened was the reserve requirements of the member banks were reduced, which meant that there was more excess reserves, which meant there could be more bank credit created. So that was, that was part of that amendment. And all the member bank reserves had to go and be deposited at the Fed. They couldn't keep some in their bank books. And, um, the result of these two significant changes in the system uh, was reported by the Federal Reserve Board. Did they give the percents? I'll uh, 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 read you some of it. The reserves for the Fed banks increased 73.6%. The investments in government securities increased 65.1%. And loans increased 31.4 percent. And I, I'll just make it just describe the banks, the member banks, right? They were making loans to individuals to buy the bonds, and they were also buying the bonds direct. You know, and all of that became collateral um, for loans and for the uh, creation of bank credit. And of course, we continued making weapons because we needed them as well as England and France. So we prospered here in this country. Okay. Um, 
and that that shows you how uh, war drives that. We ended up with uh, I have somewhere there. Uh, our debt at the end of the war was something like twenty-seven billion dollars. Twenty-seven billion. At the end of the war. And, and there would be a U.S. bombs so and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is some of my concluding remarks. Um, I know. Okay. I'll just I'll just read. Read this. The horror and pain of World War I continued for four long and terrible years for those directly involved with the fighting and their relatives and friends. Millions of people were killed, millions of people maimed, a generation slaughtered and traumatized. The bank credit system, where commercial banks create deposits or issue banknotes when they make a loan, was profit to the bank was the structure of the U.S. monetary system for over 100 years leading up to World War I. But this system was a European creation. It was found on both sides of the Atlantic in 1914. The first government chartered bank of issue was the private bank of England in 1694. It also made loans by creating deposits or issuing bank notes. This was the beginning of taking the power to create the nation's means of payment away from the government, the only place where this mighty power can be kept under public control. The more public, the better. This was the beginning of charging interest, usury, on the nation's means of payment. Let all nations teach their people the difference between government-issued money without debt and private bank credit with debt. And then, uh, this is the last concluding remark I'll make. Um, this is very interesting. Because I, I, at the beginning of the talk, I, I, I was sharing how I got interested in the period of Bretton Woods, you know, figuring out how did Harry Dexter White, he was the Treasury official who worked with the Secretary of the Treasury, Morgan Thal, and, they, and he came up with the plan for, for Bretton Woods. And I kept thinking, well, he, you know, and Morgan told didn't like the Federal Reserve Bank. They had come and threatened him. You know, if you don't do this, we're going to do this. And you won't be able to sell your treasury bonds or whatever. You know, so he, he was, they were really down on the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve sort of stepped back, you know. And uh, so I, I kept trying to figure out, you know, how did that happen, Bretton Woods, where our, our currency became the reserve currency? And I, you know, it was very interesting. And uh, so, I'm going to read this. Dear reader, while I was researching this paper, I had initially thought to also add a section on the period from 1944 to 1950, the Bretton Woods International Monetary Agreement. Okay. One of the sources I found researching this paper right here was, an, and I just found this like within the last week. This uh, was an article written by David Wheelock of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis in November of 2013. He worked for the St. Louis Bank. It, it's called, uh, his article is, The Fed's Formative Years, 1913 to 1929. So I'm going to quote. War, he's talking about World War I disrupted European financial markets and reduced the supply of trade credit loans offered by European banks, providing U.S. banks with an opening. Low U.S. interest rates, abundant reserves, and new authority to issue trade acceptances, and I'll talk about that in a little while, but they're basically loans for import and export activities enabled American banks to finance a growing share of world trade. This is during World War I. By the second half of the 1920s, over half of U.S. imports and exports were financed by dollar-denominated acceptances loans, as was a large share of the international trade of other countries. The strength of the U.S. economy 
And the greater use of the dollar for making international payments made the dollar the world's leading reserve currency. By the mid-1920s, foreign governments and central banks held more of their foreign exchange reserves in dollars than in any other country. I said, wow, you have to work, work, work way to Bretton Woods. This is in the 1920s. Um, and I'll just say a little note about Warburg. So he's on, he's on the board during the war. And then there's big controversy in 1918 because uh, it was brought up that his brother Max, back in Germany, just there, the Warburg, uh, was uh, one of the bankers for Germany. And uh, going to foreign countries to you know, get supplies for Germany and all this. So it became a big controversy in the newspapers. And, uh, and, and Warburg very reserved. You know, he, ste he stepped forward, he said, well, you know, this is my country, you know, I'm a citizen, and, but I don't want to cause trouble where it's not necessary, so I'll step down. Okay, so he stepped down from the board, you know. Where did he step into? <laughs> Can't make these stories up. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was on the advisory council of the Fed. You know, those 12 bankers, one from each Fed bank. And uh, he, he, he was uh, appointed by the New York Fed to the advisory council. So he graciously stepped down so that Paul Warburg could become a member of the advisory council of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, then, it's, and it's, this is really interesting, uh, from 1921, to 1930, and Warburg passed away, I think, in 32. Warburg uh, was responsible for creating a new bank called the International Acceptance Bank. Acceptances are loans for imports and exports. So he, he built this whole bank, and he, this was the trade, getting the US dollar out there. So he was, uh, it, it was quite a system. Um, the, the effect of tweaking the original law and creating, you know, billions of dollars of bank credit made me feel like you have, it's such a powerful bank creation, giving the power to create or to use as a means of exchange to private parties. It, this war was a hard, you know, any war is hard. This is what paid for this war. This is what paid for the weapons. Yeah. So, um, and at the end of it is the Need Act. I am hoping that this paper can explain to people why this system must be abolished for the sake of mankind on our planet. During most of our history, government controlled the power to create the means of exchange as an asset without interest. It worked much, much better and this bank credit slavery. Please visit the website of the American Monetary Institute, and I talk about Dennis Kucinich. Uh, I thank the American Monetary Institute for giving me the opportunity to prepare this research. It is an honor, and I am grateful for how much I have learned about our monetary system by doing this work. And bang on time, 10 o'clock, we got to. So um, we'll uh, reconvene here. Well, I mean, officially it's 9 a.m., but you know, um, we can sort of dribble in. And um, so I look forward to seeing as quickly as me as, as possible tomorrow morning to um, wrap up the conference and, um, and then to have a bit more of a powwow after that as well. So. Sounds good. That's right. good. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.